Good morning, Saints of First Church. It is a joy to see you in God's house on this beautiful Sunday morning. We're glad all of you are with us, especially those who may be visiting. We ask all of you, whether you're a first-time visitor, or a long-time member, or somewhere in between, if you'll sign the registration pad that you find at the end of your row, that we might have a record of your attendance with us on this Lord's Day. We'd appreciate it. We're just thrilled that you're with us. I want to call to your attention a, a few announcements that are on the opportunities page in your bulletin. We encourage you to look at all of those at your leisure following the worship service today. But let me share with you a few announcements. First of all, you have in your bulletin an insert, an envelope. Uh, throughout the year, during certain Sundays, uh, we as a denomination take up special offerings. And that's one of the, the days, today is one of the Sundays we do that. It's the Human Relations Day. Uh, our support uh, it, for this offering goes uh, to uh, neighborhood outreach and advocacy through uh, community developers and United Methodist Voluntary Services, both related to the General Board of Global Ministries and at-risk teens through the Youth Offender Rehabilitation and General Board of Church and Society. So as you feel led to contribute to this cause, we encourage you to do so. Uh, I want to remind you about Wednesday night supper that's coming up. Uh, we've got the menu here, and it'll be a wonderful time. Uh, speaking of Wednesday night suppers, on the 13th of February, the Haiti Mission Team will be sponsoring our Wednesday night suppers, and it will be a chili cook-off. So we, you can get tickets to be uh, at the cook-off and enjoy the good food, uh, and they may actually be looking for some more cooks. If you feel led to do so, Barbara Harrison is sort of coordinating. Barbara, can you raise your hand so everybody knows? There, there she is. You can contact her. She'll be glad to give you further information. And I also want to thank everybody for participating in last Wednesday's uh, Wednesday Night Supper for the benefit of Right Now Media. Let me give you some good news. Through the efforts of everybody and the grace of God, uh, the supper was able to pay for our dues to Right Now for the entire year. So we're grateful for that. If you're not part of Right Now Media, we want to encourage you to do that. Take a look at it. some wonderful material in there that uh, you would be blessed by. If you want to be a part of it, Beth Page is the person you need to talk to, and uh, she can get you signed up right away. Um, are there other announcements that need to be made? If not, it is a joy to see you in God's house on this beautiful Sunday morning. Let us now unite our hearts and minds as we prepare for worship.
I invite you now to stand as you're able as we join together in the call to worship you find printed in your bulletins. The love of God extends to the heavens and God's faithfulness extends oh, to the clouds. How precious is God's steadfast love. Let's join now together in the opening prayer. Almighty God, we come before you this day to sing your praise and to hear your word. As we prepare ourselves to live into the future you have for us, renew our hope in your promised blessings made through Jesus, your Son. Give us courage to place our lives in your hands this day and always. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 547 in your hymnals. O Church of God United. Psalter for this Lord's Day is found on page 771 in the back of your hymnals. It's Psalm 36, verses 5 to 10. I invite you now to join me in reading responsively. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, your judgment is like the deep. O Lord, O oh God, how precious is your steadfast love. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of the grass, and you give them from the river of your lives. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. O oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you, and your salvation to the upright heart.
As God's people gather together in God's house, let us turn and exchange signs of his love and peace with one another. Now's our moment for the young disciples to come on up here and join me for a quick lesson. How's that sound? Oh, all right, we've got a couple of them coming still. How are y'all doing? Very good to hear. Welcome, welcome. All right. So can anybody tell me what these are? What are these? Salt and pepper shakers. Now why in the world would I bring salt and pepper shakers up here and show them to you? I didn't get any of the breakfast. They ran out. Mm. Men's breakfast. No, that's not the answer. But worthy worthy attempt. Well, did you know that the church can be like salt and pepper? Salt, it's good on its own, right? A little bit of it is good for you, not too much. Pepper brings out a whole bunch of flavor, but when you get both of them together, what happens? What might happen when you have salt and pepper together? <laughs> what happens when we have salt and pepper together? Good flavor, tasty food, fantastic. Well, that's because salt and pepper are complementary to each other. They work well together. Now, complementary doesn't mean they say really nice things about each other, but they work well together. And each one of us has our own role in worship, has our own role in ministry and in the church. Some of us might have the talents of salt. Some of us might have the talents of pepper, whatever they may be whether it be singing well or preaching or hearing or working in the community. But when we all get together, that's where the church really shines, right? All right. So this week, next week, all of our days, can we be like salt and can we be like pepper, working together as the church? All right. Let us pray. Dear God, Dear God, we love you so much. We love you so much. And we thank you, we thank you for, all for all that you do for us and through us. Help us as we go forth to be like salt, to be like salt and, to be like pepper, and to be like pepper, working together, working together to bring out that 
really good flavor that we find in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Good morning, First Church family. The Lord said, you are the salt of the earth, um, but I like, I'm a rebel. I like to be more like the pepper, because I like spicy foods. Um, <laughs> thank you for that, Drew. We come to this time together in which we, as um, God's body, may pour out our, our praises, those things in which God has done for us in the past week that may lift up our spirits, um, and we may also have this time to, to share our concerns and the, the weights um, that are on us um, this week. Um, are there any, any shares of either praises or um, concerns um, before us this morning? We'd like to lift Alma Freedom. Remember Alma Freedom. Yes. Thank you. Yes. For Frank Daner. Yes. Remember him. Others. For Diana, too. He's not with us. Thank you. Others. Well, let us go to the Lord in prayer. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, our persistent liberator, every day you summon your slumbering people and wake us up. Stir up within us a call to repentance, a vision of your kingdom and a desire to offer ourselves to your loving work. Enlighten our lives with your grace so that we might fully live and give ourselves to Christ's mission and ministry. You taught us, your children, that there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. And there are different kinds of working but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. Help us to become transformed into Christ's likeness. Comfort us in our mortality and strengthen us to walk the path of your desire so that by word and deed, we may embody the gracious news of your faithfulness and love. Sovereign Lord, Father of all, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray for our leaders, for those whom you have gifted to remind us of you, our true shepherd, who guides us in your way. We pray for our community, that we may remain a bright beacon and that we may be strengthened in our witness. We pray for our church, for the body here that you have assembled, that we can be a voice of compassion and grace in the midst of a broken world. We pray for those who suffer, those who look upon, who you look upon with never-ending love. May we be ever so willing to do the same, and may we be enabled to perform miracles in your name that will spark a revival for your glory in and through all your people. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Now let us continue in the worship with the presentation of God's tithes, our gifts, and offerings. And I want to remind you as the ushers come forward uh, that this is Human Relations Day and you may give at this time as you feel led by God. standing, if you will, as we join together in another hymn, number 170 in your hymnals, Oh How I Love Jesus. <laughs>
And God's people did say, Amen. Thank you, choir, for your message and song this day. Good morning, Saints of First Church. Good it is good to see you. It's good to be seen, absolutely. Our text for this day comes to us from Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, his first letter. He, he really loved this group of people. He loved them and he got frustrated with them. You know, when you really love somebody and they mess up, you get frustrated with them. He really loved these folks because they, they, they get under his skin a little bit every once in a while. We know he wrote at least two letters. And some other people wrote letters too. That was a letter-getting congregation, I can tell you. But the first letter is what we're looking at today from Paul. It's the 12th chapter. We're looking at verses 4 to 11. I want to read these to you. If you have your Bible with you, I invite you to turn there. You may use the Pew Bible as well. Uh, and I'm sure you've heard these words before, but I, I pray that God will, will visit us today with his grace and help us to see some things maybe in a new light. But here now these words. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of workings, but it's the same God who inspires them all and every one. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are inspired by the one and same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Amen. Beloved, the word of God for the people of God in the house of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you this day that you have called us together under you to feed our souls once more. Give us joy that we may hear what you have to say to us this day. In your name we pray. Amen. Fathers and daughters. Well, let me begin by telling you Ingrid comes home Friday night. <laughs> We're just a little excited. And uh, uh, matter of fact, I've got to pick her up Friday at the airport, and I'm going to get there way early. It, it must be excitement because I'm going to get there earlier than my mother is supposed to get there. And I'm surprised she's not catching the plane in Seattle and riding over with her. Right? But anyway, fathers and daughters share a special bond. They really do. Uh, and for Ingrid and myself, a, a very important part of that bond that we share is, is, is humor. We both love to laugh, and we love to make each other laugh. And I like to think of myself as a pretty quick wit, but she's even faster. And it creates a weird feeling in me, a sense of pride and a sense of fear at the same time. <laughs> Whoa, i gotta, I got to do something to slow that kid down. But anyway, uh, a, a Christmas or so before we came to Washington, she bought, uh, me a Christmas present. It was two tickets to go see a famous comedian at the Durham Performing Arts Center. So we went together. We laughed a little bit. Truth be told, I think she and I could have done a better job. But anyway, uh, we got some wisdom there too. The opening act was a comedian named John Bowman. 
And Bowman said something that stuck with me, and I wrote it down, and I'm going to share it with you today. He said, I'm not a big fan of the institutional church. I have some deeply held personal beliefs, but I don't feel any need to get together with other people and actually do anything about them. Bowman's comments represent, I think, a very puzzling and in some sense a very troubling paradox that is in our world today. Uh, we live in a day and an age where increasingly we are recognizing and in no few instances actually celebrating differences among us. But at the same time, we're seeing an erosion of any sense of a principle meant to unify us and bring us together. And in this, as a result, what we end up with is uh, division and brokenness, disconnection as everybody goes their own separate way and we get nowhere fast. Uh, a few years ago, Jim Dennison and his Dennison blog talked about the state of the world around us, particularly the state of our nation, and he quoted an article from the Washington Post that said, currently speaking, the gulf between the vision of a united America and the current political reality has never seemed wider. Dennison went on to comment, he said, you know, Unit, holding unity and, and difference together has always been a real challenge. He said, apart from any external threat, we have a human tendency to want to advance our own causes and our own agendas. Differences create discussion and division among us that creates more differences and so forth and so on. And what we end up with is a fragmentation that's exacerbated by political rancor and moral dissolution. He said essentially unity is strongest when it is a consequence of a larger cause. This paradox of trying to hold unity and difference together, it's not uh, something that uh, the, the church is immune to either. We find ourselves struggling as we have from the very beginning with this idea of how do we hold these two in tandem. And it seems as if we have entered into what I call an age of ecclesial disconnection. In other words, a disconnection within the church. Now, it's not a new problem for God's people. It's a serious problem, but there's good news. There is hope. There is a way that this disconnection can be connected again. There is a way that we can hold these ideas in tandem. But in an age where it seems as we're more bent on going our way than to going together we have to decide whether or not we're so bold as to actually seek after the solution. Uh, in our text, Brother Paul, as I told you earlier, is talking to the good citizens at First Church Corinth. Now, Corinth was a trading center. For some reason, when I think of Corinth, I think of New York. It's a crossroads of the world kind of community. It's very cosmopolitan. Uh, it is very diverse. And Paul goes there and he preaches the gospel and he helps to establish the church at Corinth. And he stays with them a little bit over a year before he goes on to his further missionary journey. But it's pretty clear from the way that Paul writes, one of his biggest fears, one of his biggest concerns for First Church Corinth is that they maintain this sense of unity that has brought them, different though they may be, together. And he had good reason to do that because not too long after he left, problems began to arise up. Some of the uniqueness among the, the congregation had begun to spring up and threaten their unity. Now they were unique people and they were very spiritually gifted people. However, they did not really understand the interdependence between their uniqueness and the unity that had called them together as a body in the first place. And the end result was you had people at First Church Corinth who began to see and possess their spiritual gifts in a selfish fashion. They began to treat one another in a condescending fashion. Oh, you just don't understand. And they began to set them against one another. And the end result of all of that was that the church became stagnant their mission and ministry was left unfulfilled. 
and their spiritual growth was stunted. And Paul understood that. And so he wrote to them the words that would help them to get this disconnection back together again. And God's people at the corner of West 2nd and Van Norden said, What are you talking about, Ken? And he said, I'm glad you asked. What did Paul tell us? It's an important thing. We have to begin by understanding that Paul is saying to us that when we as a church or believers are not focused on Jesus Christ and his lordship and his eternal truth, we are in grave danger. If we're not focused on him, we're in trouble. Listen again to what he wrote. He said, there are a variety of gifts, but it's the same spirit. There are a variety of services, but it's the same Lord. There are a variety of workings, but it is the same God that inspires them all in every one. Now, I've read that passage a lot over the years. And I imagine a lot of you have done like I've done. I've looked at that passage, and the word that seemed to be jumping out at me was variety. And that's important, and we're going to talk about the importance of variety in just a minute. But the real importance, as I struggle with this again this week, the real important word, the real important concept that, I, that Paul, I believe, is trying to communicate to us through this is not varieties, but same. As in, it is the same Spirit. It is the same Lord. It is the same God. Paul is trying to encourage his readers and his hearers to understand that we must see our focus as being submitted under the Lordship of Jesus Christ and standing on his truth and see that as the means by which he calls us from our different walks of life together for his glory. In First Church Corinth, they didn't see it that way. And the people were beginning to fracture. They were forming cliques within the church. And it was threatening to tear the fabric of faith apart. It was threatening the foundation of that body. And so Paul is trying to correct this by reminding them, hey, come back to what brought you together in the first place. And that's when you knelt and received God's grace and you stood on his truth. You see, without that focus, God's people then and now are in danger of wandering from the truth and down the dead end of self-congratulatory correctness and goodness born of idolatry and individualism. Rob Wilkins and Robert Lewis in their book, The Church of the Irresistible Influence. I love that name, don't you? The Church of the Irresistible Influence. Wrote about the, the struggles that took place as the massive tunnel underneath the English Channel that connects France and England was built, that the, the tunnel known as the Channel, you've heard of the Channel? The French had another name for the project. They called it Bicephaly, which means two-headed. There were two organizations, two uh, companies that were built from scratch at the very beginning to handle the project, and they had equal representation from France and from, from England. But as the project continued, it became pretty clear that there was no unified plan how to do this thing. One of the project managers said, we had a lot of frustration on this project because the organizations created were not created to generate solutions. They were created to generate blame. Another one of the project workers said, yes, we had a lot of breakdowns. The writers of the book, uh, uh, Ro the Roberts, Lewis, and, and Wilkins, they studied the project a little bit. They soon came to understand what the real problem was. The problem was there had not been a set of shared standards. You had people from two different countries working on the project. They spoke two different languages, had different words for everything. They used different tools. They even had different ways of measuring sea depth. One of the people on the project said, when you have people from two different countries working on a project, each of them believes that only their regulations are the right ones. So what happens when you have countless individuals who believe that their regulations are the right ones. When we as the church forget that the sole aim, purpose, reason, power for our being together is our submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, 
when we have more trust in our impetuous opinions rather than the truth of Christ, we're going to run into danger. Paul says, remember what brought you together in the first place, your oneness. Now, that being said, we have to admit that Paul also here says that everybody, everybody who lives under the lordship and stands on the truth of Christ, who's part of the kingdom of God, has something to contribute to the work of the kingdom. Paul emphasizes our oneness, but he also says, you know what? Y'all come from different places. And you have different things to offer. And he saw that as something to celebrate and give glory to God for. And he encourages the Corinthians and us to do the same thing. There are varieties. And thank God for it. Think about it. What a dry, dull, insipid place the body of Christ would be if every one of us was exactly the same. If all of us were preachers, who would listen to the sermons? Ooh, they laughed a little bit more about that in the public. Write that down, Stephen. If we all sang in the choir, who would be in the congregation to be moved by the music? If all of us were solely intently focused on the work of mission and mercy, who in the world would make sure the light bill gets paid and the heating bill gets paid by using the gift of administration? What would we lose in the rich history and liturgy of the church if we absolutely insisted that everybody has to worship the exact same way? You see, we are unique. And it's a blessing, provided that we understand that we are under the lordship of Jesus Christ together. We've been differently gifted, and it's a wonderful blessing. But we've been given the gifts for a purpose, to help lead others to the light of Christ, that they might live under his rule as well, right? I read that word from Paul, and I'm encouraged. It's empowering, and it's encouraging, because what he's saying is that every single one of us have a positive contribution to make to the work of the kingdom. Even though our gift might seem less than when compared to the great gifts, the visible gifts of the church. James Robison, in his book, Living Amazed, talks about three of the most important bones in your body. But they're also the smallest. They form, I've got to check with my authority here, they form the inner or the middle ear ossicle. And they consist of the malleus, which is the hammer, the incus, the anvil, and the stapes, the stirrup. Is that right, ma'am? Thank you. (laughs) You don't see those with the naked eye. We can't see those, those bones with the naked eye. But without those bones being there in the right formation, about one tenth of all the power of sound would make it to our eardrums. And then you all would hear like I hear. Not very well. But God put them together in just the right way so that we get maximum energy hitting our eardrums so that we can hear. Even though they're diminutive in size, they make a tremendous difference. Robinson says that's the way it is for us in the kingdom of God. Every single one of us has our own sphere of influence whether it's large or whether it's small. And we have a role to play in the redemptive, restorative work of God. Each of us has an important role to play in God's eternal plan. Did you know that? That's how important you are. You have a role to play in God's eternal plan. We live in a world that tries to demonstrate how we can live in unity. and Constantly they fail to live up to the standard they set for themselves. It's the church that lives under the lordship of Christ and standing on his truth that shows us how we can come together from different walks of life as we are united in him and we can make a difference in the world in his name. And that's what he's ultimately telling telling us. He's saying as we stand in his lordship, as we stand on his truth, we can do Great things in the name of the kingdom. Francis Schaeffer in his work, The Church Before the Watching World, said this, We can't expect the world to believe that the Father sent the Son. 
that all of Jesus' claims are true and that Christianity is true unless we are willing to present to the world a powerful representation of our oneness as Christians. Listen, if we cannot stand as one under his lordship, then how in the world is our message ever going to convince our community and our world? If we're so busy following a variety of opinions that we can't stand on the truth, how in the world can we communicate the good news of oneness in Christ Jesus? <coughs> Think of it this way. The power, the energy in 10 gallons of gasoline can be released in a couple of ways. It can be directly released when you drop a match into a container and it goes in 40 different directions in a destructive fashion and then it's gone. Or that same gasoline can be channeled <coughs> intentionally through a committed engine system and it will transport an individual 350 miles. How are we using the gifts, the graces, the influence, the power, the witness that we've been given as followers of Jesus Christ? Is it best just to release that in a destructive fashion that's gone in an instant? Or do we want to channel that together through a committed system of grace to move God's people forward? You see, a church that's willing to commit itself to moving forward together can make the world a different place in the name of Jesus. A church that is not committed to that is good for confusion and stagnation. It's pretty simple, folks. If our focus is not on the Lordship of Christ and standing on His truth, we're in danger. The good news is that all of us who do that, we've got something to offer to, to the world in the name of Jesus. And if we'll do that together in his name, we can make a difference in this community and in the world around us. We'll see the kingdom of God coming upon the earth if we're willing to live together under him. You see, that's how you fix the problem. That's how we see a healing of the ecclesial disconnection. All together in his name. Thanks be to God for his word to us this day. Amen. Our hymn of going forth this morning is hymn number 555 in the hymnal. Forward through the ages.
I am very grateful to God that he allowed me to come to the corner of 304 and West 2nd, who allowed all of us from the different walks of life from which we come to come together in his name, that we might do his work in our community and the world. And I thank God for that blessing. I hope you do as well. Until we are together again, receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.